Thank you everyone for being here at our webinar for TURN. We're very excited to have you join us. And so many people have come in from different parts of the world and all across Australia, it's fantastic. To start today, and in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of everyone, the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waters of Australia, New Zealand and all nations. And I offer my respect to the elders, past, present and emerging as we work towards a just and equitable and reconciled Australia and other lands, and one where we recognise and build our shared knowledge and experiences. Today I'm speaking from the Chibukai land, which is rainforest country in far north Queensland. Please feel free to put into the chat session where you're listening in from and watching us. So again, I thank you all for joining us today. And for those that haven't met me, my name is Beryl Morris, and I'm the director of TURN, Australia's Ecosystem Observatory. So throughout our sessions today, do feel free to ask your questions, but do it through the Q&A function, uh, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer them towards the end of the webinar. If you have any technical issues, uh, please feel free to comment in the chat function, and we'll try to resolve that as soon as we can. You can also use the chat function to get in touch with other attendees if you wish. Um, we, at the end of the webinar, we've put a little rating survey to, that uh, appears in a separate browser as you leave the meeting. If you had time, we would love you to use that to assist in our turn reporting. And you should be aware that we're recording the webinar today. We hope that that's a service that you will enjoy when you want to come back to revisit this, what we hear today. And you can share that with those who could not attend the webinar. So just oops, moving along. Um, TURN is very much a national um, ecosystem observatory, but it is only made possible by all of the funding groups that look after us. Um, that's ENCRIS and state governments and all of our operating partners that you can see in this screen. So we would like to, you to recognize that this is quite a family affair that we uh, are able to bring you webinars like this. So today, um, I'd like you to, uh, if you want to know lots about our speakers today, have a look at the bios that we sent out before the webinar. But we are very pleased and excited to have with us three fantastic people who know a lot about water in ecosystems. We've got Eloise Nation, who's a senior hydrologist at the Bureau of Meteorology working out of Melbourne. We have Dr. Tim McVicker from CSIRO, where he is an eco-hydrologist uh, leading the time series remote sensing team. And we also have Associate Professor Sally Thompson, who's uh, working from the University of Western Australia. Um, and she is also into eco-hydrology. So lots of people who um, really understand this. What I'm going to do is hand over to Eloise to start her talk and each speaker will hand over to the next person in the list until we have finished all of our three talks and then it will be your chance to, to hear the answers to the questions that come up. So I'm going to cease sharing my screen and you will then be able to see Eloise. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Beryl, and good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be talking to you about Australia's Atlas of Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems. And I'm going to start uh, with an introduction to Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems, or GDEs. So GDEs are ecosystems that rely on groundwater for all or some of their water requirements. And this can be uh, permanent or intermittent. Uh, GDEs include wetlands, springs, rivers, vegetation, caves, and aquifers. And I think you'll be surprised to, to realize that many of your favorite natural systems are actually uh, GDEs. GDEs have um, uh, environmental, economic, and cultural values. 
So environmentally, they're important for uh, biodiversity. They also provide habitat for listed species. They can act as drought refuges when uh, surface water is low, and they are also important for water purification. Economically, GDEs support plants and animal communities that are used for food production, for example, for fisheries. Uh, they can also be important sites for tourism and for recreation. And culturally, some GDEs are indigenous uh, sites. Uh, like waterholes, caves, and uh, springs. And that's why it's so important for us to, to protect these environmental assets. And the first step to being able to protect them is, is to know about where they are. And we're very lucky in Australia to have access to the GDE Atlas. That's Australia's national repository of GDEs. So the GDE Atlas provides information about the location and attributes of GDEs. And uh, you can see a screenshot there of uh, what the GDE Atlas looks like. There's also a URL link to where you can find the GDE Atlas on the Bureau's website. And uh, my colleague, Anthony, Anthony Brinkley, will paste the URL in the chat so you can have a look at the GDE Atlas in your own time. Now, the GDE Atlas is one of the only national GDE data sets in the world, which makes it uh, particularly special. And uh, its main purpose is to provide GDE data for decision making. And the Atlas is generally thought of as a first port of call for GDE data. It provides uh, data that's at a national to state and territory to regional scale. So it's useful for people to uh, quickly get access to GDE data, but they then follow it up with uh, more detailed local scale studies. The GDE Atlas contains three types of GDE information. So the first type of GDEs are aquatic GDEs. So they're ones that rely on the surface expression of groundwater. And these include things like wetlands, streams and springs. And the GDE Atlas has a natural, uh, national coverage of these types of GDEs. The second type of GDEs are terrestrial GDEs. And these are ones that rely on the subsurface presence of groundwater. So these is things like uh, vegetation, whose roots uh, access the groundwater. And the GDE Atlas has an almost national coverage of this type of GDEs. We're just missing uh, data for the southern part of the Northern Territory. And the last type of GDEs are subterranean ones. So they're cave and aquifer ecosystems beneath the, the Earth's surface and they provide habitat for stygofauna. The GDE Atlas at this stage only has limited coverage of subterranean GDEs. We only have caves for Queensland and uh, for Tasmania, but we are keen to extend uh, the coverage to the rest of Australia and to include um, aquifer uh, ecosystems as well. The GDE data in the Atlas comes from two sources. There's recent state and territory mapping, and that's been provided to us from state and territory agencies. So they've done more detailed mapping uh, in their jurisdictions, and we've worked together to incorporate that data into the GDE Atlas and to standardize it to the GDE Atlas data model and terminology. And where this data isn't available, uh, we provide the original data from the national assessment that was done in 2012. And uh, the GDE Atlas includes both known and potential GDEs. So the known GDEs are those identified through field work, whereas the potential GDEs uh, are those identified through desktop assessments. Uh, using a range of different methods. 
So the methods include things like analysis of satellite imagery, as well as GIS application of rules or uh, conceptual models that define where we can expect to see GDEs. And the good thing about the GDE Atlas is that we've um, created the symbology such that it highlights uh, the data sources and also whether the GDEs are known or potential. So the colour of the feature on the map indicates the data source and then the shade indicates whether it's known uh, or a potential GDE, a high potential, medium or low potential. GDEs can be affected by um, activities or processes that modify groundwater quantity and quality. So some of these activities include groundwater extraction, mining, construction and climate change. And I've got an example here on the screen that shows that um, extraction, for example, can lower the water table and remove the hydraulic connection between groundwater and uh, the river GDE in this example. And for this reason, it's very important to consider uh, GDEs in environmental impact assessments of new developments and in water management planning. And that's where the GDE Atlas comes into play. So the GDE Atlas provides data, at least um, an initial set of data that can be used to inform environmental impact statements and water management. For this reason, the GDE Atlas is noted as a key reference in some of the, um, the national documents uh, relating to environmental impact assessments and management. So for example, the GDE Atlas is noted as a key resource in the IESC explanatory note on GDEs and how to incorporate GDEs into environmental impact assessments. It's also noted in the National Groundwater Strategic Framework, which is a, uh, a national strategic plan for groundwater in Australia. And I've just got a, a quote there on the screen from the Office of Water Science in the Australian Government Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment um, that indicates their, their use of the GDE Atlas on a daily basis in their work providing advice under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. <clears throat> okay, so now I've given an introduction to GDEs and to the GDE Atlas. Now I'd like to talk uh, a bit about some of the opportunities for enhancing the GDE data that's available and uh, making GDE data uh, more available. So um, the GDE data that is in the Atlas at the moment is um, it's a series of static maps. Whereas we know that GDEs are um, dynamic over time. So their groundwater use and also their spatial extent uh, can vary over time. And so there are some new um, satellite techniques that are able to resolve these variations and produce dynamic GDE mapping. And I've got an example on the screen here that's come from CSIRO. They've developed a method using synthetic, synthetic aperture radar uh, to be able to resolve these uh, differences or the variation in uh, groundwater use and um, GDE extent over time. And uh, my colleague Anthony will paste a link to their paper in the chat and so you can have a look at that too. The second opportunity is to get access to industry GDE data. So we know that a wealth of GDE data is collected uh, for environmental impact statements. So well, the GDE Atlas is used um, to initially get data um, at a core scale, but this is often followed up by detailed um, site scale studies. And this data is often trapped in um, PDF reports or remains within uh, consultancies or um, 
uh, different uh, companies and isn't available for reuse. So there's potential there for the data to be submitted as part of uh, the assessment process in a reusable format such that it can be accessed by the community and um, used more generally. And the final opportunity I want to talk about is the potential to integrate uh, data from the GDE Atlas with other data and other products. So we know that uh, decision making around GDEs involves analysis of many different data sets. So the GDEs themselves plus information about the development, information about species, depth to water table, so quite a lot of data sets. Uh, so what we're looking at doing is publishing the GDE data as web services or spatial APIs so that people can get a direct uh, live connection to the data and they can use it in their desktop GISs and combine with other data sets or they can add uh, the GDE Atlas data to their own web products. And we've made a start on this with the inflow dependence grid that uh, comes from the GDE Atlas. This is now available as a web service or spatial API through the Australian Water Data Service. And again, my colleague Anthony will uh, paste a link to the Australian Water Data Service in the chat. We're now working on publishing the GDE layers as well as, um, uh, as uh, spatial APIs. So they should be available shortly. So what this will do is to facilitate integration with other data sets and other products. We've already got some early examples of how the Atlas um, data can be integrated with other web products. So this example here comes from the South Australian Resource Information Gateway. It's a, um, a web portal that provides uh, information that's needed to do impact assessments in South Australia. And they've recently added the GDE Atlas data to their website. So it's not as a web service at this stage. Uh, they've just uh, downloaded a, a version of the data and added it that way. So it's not dynamic, but uh, we'll, we'd look to make it dynamic in the future. And uh, there you can see an example of the GDE mapping in their portal. Okay, so thank you. Today I've, I've given you a bit of an introduction to GDEs, um, to the GDE Atlas and talked about some of the opportunities for improving GDE data and improving access to it. I'd like to leave you uh, with some links uh, to the, the Bureau Groundwater Products on the Bureau website and also our email address so that you can uh, get into contact and provide us with feedback. Uh, and again, my colleague Anthony will paste that in the chat. And I think I will leave it there and hand over to Tim for his presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Alois. Can, oh, I'm hoping that people can hear me. Um, maybe if someone can say in the chat that they can, that'd be great. Um, hi, ni hao, hola, and g'day. Is that my name's Tim McVicker, and I'm talking about how we've developed a multi decade operational gap free Australia wide high resolution monthly 30 metre actual evapotranspiration data set. I'd just like to acknowledge all my co-authors that you can see there on the slide and also a special thanks to all those involved with the TURN OzFlux network. If we didn't have the TURN net, uh, Flux network, we wouldn't be able to do this work. So just briefly, what is evapotranspiration? It's the phase change from a liquid to a gas. So that's the, the process that we're talking about and we're talking about the, the compound water. So that's that's the process that we're talking about today. It occurs it occurs through leaves where we have CO2 going into the stomata and water and oxygen leaving the stomata. It also happens off the the surface of the ground and also off the surfaces of vegetation after rainfall called interception. 
And so it's important for the catchment water bounce, the, the process of evapotranspiration, the rate of evapotranspiration, and with the amount of precipitation coming into a catchment and the amount of evapotranspiration leaving is that the other two main terms are the runoff, the water in the, in the stream network and the groundwater recharge that Eloise just spoke about previously with the GDEs, the expression of that. So that's the main process of evapotranspiration that we're talking about in today. And actual evapotranspiration, it's important for looking at the catchment and landscape water balance, tracking water use efficiency. And in Australia, 70% uh, of the precipitation becomes actual evapotranspiration. And Australia is about 7.8 million square kilometres, so it's a large area. And to estimate actual evapotranspiration over that such a large area is that an, an approach that is often used is using remote sensing. And these can be both either reflective um, algorithms from uh, reflective satellites or through um, temperature, through thermal remote sensing. And in this project, we're using the Somerset algorithm. It was initially developed by one of my co-authors, Juan, Juan Gershman, in, that was published in Journal of Hydrology in 2009. And for the last year or so, we've been doing a major refresh of the Somerset algorithm, where we've been looking at more sensors. It was originally only done with MODIS. It is now done with Landsat, Veers, a new collection of MODIS and Sentinel-2. And we now have more flux towers and more catchments, the flux towers from the Oznet, the Ozflux network, sorry, and more catchments available through the Bureau of Meteorology, through the water division of the Bureau of Meteorology. So we've just released a, a product, uh, the Somerset Landsat version 2.2 that uses Landsat, Modus and Veers remotely sensed data. It's from February 2000 to current, um, high spatial resolution at 30 meters and a high temporal frequency monthly for the entire nation. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about that and about some of the, uh, the Sumset algorithm next. Okay, but just in case people aren't so aware of some of the different uh, remote sensing products, is that this is just a comparison of MODIS with Landsat. So we can see here that we've got MODIS on the left-hand side with its lower spatial resolution and Landsat on the right-hand side with its higher spatial resolution. In the yellow circle, we can see that an airport, we can see the cross of the two runways. We've got some central pivot irrigation areas and we've also got some plantation areas that we can see that the, the green areas that we can see through the two images but the what, what's of most important as well as or as important as the spatial resolution is also the temporal frequency. So MODIS comes over every day and Landsat is every 16 days. And when you've got cloud with the um, coming over, you know, in wet parts of the country and in wet times of the year, is that that means that the gap in Landsat imagery can be anywhere up to three months. And so if you're trying to close a water balance model, having a gap in of three months in your actual evapotranspiration estimate makes it really hard to close the water balance model. And so this is why we do Landsat modus and Landsat beers blending to infill any gaps that we have in the Landsat data. So the Somerset algorithm, it's an empirical model and it basically, it modifies the demand limit, the potential of apotranspiration calculated by the Priestley-Taylor form of potential of apotranspiration. It modifies that by taking into account the transpiration, near surface water availability and also interception. And it's got eight coefficients and we calibrate those coefficients using the flux towers and minimize that the differences to between the observations of the flux towers and the estimates for, that we get from the Somerset algorithm. It's based on two main indices, uh, the EVI, the Enhanced Vegetation Index, and the Residual Moisture Index, which is a combination of the GVMI and the EVI. There's an internal um, calibration performed there. And in addition to the reflective remote sensing, 
Um, it also requires potentially tea and precipitation. And we access these from the Bureau of Meteorology who calculate those uh, from their isolated observations at the MET stations and then interpolate those into daily grids. And it's calibrated at 30 flux towers. So we can see on the map of Australia here, the 30 flux towers, the Oz flux um, network. And these are the pink triangles scattered throughout the country, uh, some in the centre of the country as well, just south of the Northern Territory symbol there. Uh, we also have there's seven standing water bodies. Their locations are identified with this, um, the circles, the greeny circle. And there are 638 catchments which are used for evaluation. Um, and when we perform the, the calibration and the, the validation, we've compared that to some global models and we're getting similar stats, slightly better in some cases, uh, similar stats, statistics of best fit um, compared to those uh, global models. But the big difference is, is that those global models, they, well, they're obviously global, um, but their best resolution is one kilometre, whereas with Landsat, we have 30 metre resolution. So if you're looking at GDEs or paddock water use, uh, farm water use is that having that 30 metre spatial resolution is really important. And that's something that we've, um, is apparent in the processing that we've done. So the processing, it was performed on Google Earth Engine um, and it was a it was a large compute job. Um, there's over 140,000 Landsat images, totaling over 75 terabytes of input imagery that we've used. So it's the, the infrastructure that we need, the computational infrastructure that we need to perform a continental wide uh, 30 meter monthly um, processing, it's, it's substantial. There's no doubt about that. We, we thank Google for their assistance and it's it's been you know great, basically, what we've been able to do, I think. And so basically, so with the blending is that we see here is that on the left-hand column, we've got Landsat only, and we can see that we've got some gaps. So this is January in 2018. So up in the top end of Australia, there's usually the summer monsoon. So we can see we've got some gaps in the imagery where we don't have any data over the land mass. And as a hydrologist, when you don't have data, you know, how do you gap fill it? You know, it's always a, it's, it's a painful experience. You just want to get on and do your modeling, do your analysis. And so what we've done is we, we use some, some geostatistical uh, processes where we blend Landsat, so the low resolution, sorry, the high resolution but low frequency Landsat data with the low resolution but high frequency VIAs data or MODIS data. And so that allows us to simulate what the Landsat-like resolution would have been at those times when there are no Landsat observations. And so down the bottom here, we see that we go from some large gaps and then we're infilling those gaps where we've got VIAs data available, but recognising that the top end of Australia and southern Tas well, parts of Tasmania, uh, they can be very cloudy in certain seasons. And so we, at a, at a last resort, we do some interpolation to backfill it. One of the important things is with the product is that we let users know whether the, the data source, whether it's green, as in good, good to go, um, well, it's all good to go, um, but the, the green data is from Landsat, the orange data is the, in this instance, the Landsat V is blend and the red data are interpolated data. And a user in the quality control uh, channel that we have with the monthly data, the user can interrogate this data. They can also determine what the, the number of Landsat observations that have gone into the monthly estimate. And we also um, inform the user whether it's the scan line correction error is turned on from Landsat 7 um, and a couple of other um, bits in there that people can explore. So why we do this, why we do the blending is that um, we can see the bar chart here. So from um, 2012 to 2021 on the x-axis, time on the x-axis with the percentage of areas 
um, that are either from the Landsat data in blue, the Veers Landsat blend in orange, or the um, the interpolated data in grey. And we can see here for all of Australia, um, you know, once we get to about 2013, we usually have greater than 90% of the data is from Landsat. But if we look at the Daintree Ibra region, so this is an area that is um, of great biodiversity significance to Australia, the Daintree, the wet tropical rainforest north of Cairns. Um, it's a very moist area with a lot of cloud. And so and we can see that seasonality in, of the cloud in the Landsat cloud-free images. So the, the size of the blue bars in this bottom uh, time series plot that we can see here. But with what we've done with the Landsat blending with either Veers or Modus is that if you want to look at the catchment water balance in the Dane tree, you've got data that has no gaps in it. So you can, it's, it's good to go. Um, and, but you can also interrogate what the data source is from the, the output grids that we produce. So that's important. Uh, how to access the data? You can access it through the Turn Discovery Portal um, and also through Google Earth Engine. Um, and it's it's a Google Earth Engine asset, and then APIs can be written in either Python or JavaScript to directly um, interact with that data. We also have um, so it's it's currently the version two point two of the data is currently um, being put up as a into the Google Earth Engine catalog, and we also have a AET Explorer. Um, that I'll show next. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quit sharing in PowerPoint and then I'll start sharing in the Google Earth Engine AET Explorer. So I'll be back in five to 10 seconds. Wish me luck. Okay, here I am. I should be back. Okay, so this is the Google AET Explorer. And let me just do, just do F11 to, yep, there we go to make it a little bit larger. Okay, so we've got the map of Australia there with the, the 30 flux towers located on it. Oh, there's an error generating that. Why is that? Goodness gracious. That's um, the joys of live demos. Okay, so we're generating a chart. Oh, goodness. Mm, this is most <laughs> uncomfortable. Sorry about this, everyone. We really, we haven't seen this before. Um, you can pan and zoom with the data set and we can see here that we've got an irrigation area. So this is just to the west of Brisbane. These are the islands here in Brisbane. What we'll do is we'll just put up a small polygon. We'll define a polygon and hopefully that we're going to generate a chart on the fly. This is just taking a little bit of time. Tim, we've had some chat saying that maybe it's because the curse is out in the ocean. Ah, okay. Well, we've, we've got the chart now, so hopefully that's okay. Okay, so we can see the chart. So here we can see the actual evapotranspiration. We can see that it's got the units of millimetres per day. You can select what different uh, units that you wish to display the data in. It's either in depth units or volumetric units. Um, the change in pixel size from the north of Australia to the south of Australia as a function of convergence, all of that is all taken into account. And then we can, we can change the display by clicking on different months across the chart. So here we've got, this is June, so in winter where there's no summer irrigation. And then if we click on a, let's just say, well, let's just go to the, the next, uh, the previous summer, we can see that we've got some summer irrigation in there again. So you can zoom in to look at any area of Australia um, and, you know, very high resolution. So, you know, we can see here, we've got a small town and we can see, you know, all of the irrigation uh, that is occurring close to that town. 
um, that would be sort of Gundawindi, St George, somewhere like that, um, out in sort of southwestern Queensland. And you can also track, you know, GDEs, riparian vegetation, um, you know, what, whatever you wish to. And then with this is that what we can do is we can then click on this, um, this export square, and then that will allow us to export the data that we see on the chart as a CSV file. And I'll just show you what that is. We'll go back into PowerPoint. So again, it'll take me another 10 or 15 seconds to go back. Okay, I'll speak with you soon again. Okay, so we've just we've just had a bit of a bit of a demo, live demo where things crash, um, but it was all working for the smaller area on the fly, so that was good. Okay, so with the uh, the CSV file is that it just looks like this. It tells you what version of Somerset it is. This is these are some data from the previous version 2.1. We strongly recommend that people use version 2.2. It's a longer time period. It's got slightly better calibration, and it also tells you the units of the display that you're in, either millimeters per day, megalitres per month, whatever the units are that you wish to. Um, so just the wrap up is that we've we've updated the calibration. We now have more sensors that the Sumset algorithm is calibrated to and with much finer spatial resolutions. Um, currently, we've developed with Landsat Modus blending and Landsat Veers blending. We've developed a time series for Australia that's monthly from February 2000 onwards. And the data are ready to use. They're, they're very useful for closing the water balance, tracking the water use of GDEs. It's being used for irrigation compliance. The pixel quality assurance band that's provided on a monthly time step as well that allows users to perform deep interrogation of the data. Um, and the future directions from this data is that it will allow people to monitor water use efficiency. So in Australia, we talk a lot about uh, water use and water use efficiency, and this provides a consistent, repeatable, accurate measure of water use across the continent in space and time. We would like to move uh, potentially from monthly to fortnightly, but that would mean, for example, that the the data set that we've developed is about the monthly time step is 12 terabytes. Moving to fortnightly, fortnightly would be 24 terabytes. Um, turn cloud storage in total is my understanding is 50 terabytes. So potentially one project would be using 50% of the, the resource that Turn has available. Um, so whether or not we do that or not, I'm not exactly sure. And really with water information systems, we can see the bottom two graphics. We really want to move from old school um, where you know, you're looking at death ridge wheels and doing that sort of uh, sampling um, to potentially new school where you're using satellite remote sensing, but definitely linked in with ground-based observations through models. And that's, that I think is, is the real key with it. And I've just provided here the, uh, the AET Explorer um, that Jamie developed. Uh, Jamie is the, the key software engineer on the team. Um, so he's done all of the, uh, the processing in Google Earth Engine and also developed that um, AET Explorer. But we'd definitely like to thank all the individuals involved in the TURN OSFLUX network. If we didn't have that, we couldn't do this. This, this is really an example, I think, of scaling up from the points where the OSFLUX towers are located um, to the entire continent. And that's something that's really central in turn is that idea of scaling up. So no matter where you are in the country, you're there, there is now data available. We also would like to thank Google for Google Earth Engine, the USGS, NASA and the European Space Agency for the provision of free remotely sensed data and the BOM for the daily met grids. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Thanks for your time and hand over to Sally. Bye bye. Thanks, Tim. I'm going to start sharing and we'll see how we go with that. Kaya, hello, everybody from 
Wajuk Noongar Budja. I'm speaking from the University of Western Australia on the banks of the very beautiful Derbal Yerrigan, also known as the Swan River. And I would like to acknowledge that the Noongar people are the cultural custodians of this land, continue to practice their culture and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. As the academic on the panel today, I am going to take a slightly less research and maybe more education style oriented take on this question of water in ecosystems with a really high level overview of why these things are connected at all. So what is an ecosystem? Just to ask the really dopey question. Fundamentally, when we think of an ecosystem, we're talking about a bunch of co-located living organisms connected by the flow of energy. And what that really means is that they eat each other. So that if we are looking at say the Banksia woodland ecosystem, where one of Turn's Ausflux towers is located near Perth, what we have is a nectar-based ecosystem where honey possums, cockatoos, honey eaters, and various insects are mostly getting their energy from the nectar in flowers, in turn being predated by each other and ultimately by the top predators. So, that's an ecosystem. What's the relationship with water? Well, fundamentally, this energy that is flowing through these organisms, creating that ecosystem, comes from photosynthesis. You know photosynthesis. It's that really nifty trick that plants have. That one where they manage to eat some air, wash it down with a bit of sunshine as a source of energy, and somehow, miraculously, really, it always seems like a miracle to me, they convert air and sunshine into fruit, into roots, into flowers and stems, into leaves, in short, into the sorts of things that organisms can eat. But photosynthesis requires water. Why does it require water? I want to explain this in a bit more detail. Photosynthesis takes place inside the plant's cells, which means for this miraculous conversion to occur, air and sunshine also both need to make their way inside a plant. And really, this is what leaves are for. Leaves are thin and translucent so that light can shine into them and into the plant's cells. But leaves have a waxy coating and air cannot diffuse through that waxy coating. So to let the air in that is needed for photosynthesis, plants need openings through that coating. These are what we call stomata and there are hundreds of them on leaves, usually found on the lower surface of the leaf. However, it is wet inside a leaf in the same way that it's wet inside you and me. Living things tend to be wet on the inside. And so what this means is that if we have openings into the interior of the leaf, that provides a pathway for evaporation. Water escapes through these openings. We call this transpiration. Tim's told you a lot about it and how to observe it. Transpiration is a problem for plants because if too much water escapes from inside them, they will dehydrate and they will die. Even worse, because it tends to happen earlier than complete dehydration, as leaves start to dry out, air bubbles will form in the water carrying vessels within the plants. We call these air bubbles embolisms and it's a bit similar to getting a blood clot in one of your veins. Once there's an air bubble in the vessels, water can't get through them anymore in the same way that blood can't get through the vein with the DVT in it. 
And in just the same way that you or I would be in great trouble if there were many blood clots forming in many of our blood vessels, the same is true for embolism in plants. If enough of these air bubbles form within the water carrying vessels, the plant is no longer able to send water through itself and it will die, which is a pretty high price to pay for eating, if you think about it. So this means that plants need to be able to close their stomata when they are at risk of drying out. The problem with this, of course, is that once stomata are closed, photosynthesis can't continue anymore. No more than you or I could eat a cheeseburger if somebody glued our lips shut, something which, by the way, I hope does not happen to you or to me. What this means is that when things become too dry, photosynthesis does not take place. Now, here's a little bit more satellite data. This one's been processed into a global map of photosynthesis. And the darker green things are, the more photosynthesis is taking place. What you'll notice is that if we look at reasonably dry locations, such as, say, Central Australia, we don't see a lot of green. These are places where there's not much water and there's not much photosynthesis taking place. Even if we look at some of the driest parts of the world, say North Africa and through the Middle East, in this map, those are actually rendered in grey because there's so little plant life there that the photosynthesis signal is pretty hard to pick up from a satellite. So from this introduction, I hope there are three messages that become really clear. The first of these is that photosynthesis requires water because plants need to be able to open those stomata to eat that carbon dioxide. The second is that ecosystems run on photosynthesis because they're all about the flow of energy. And so the conclusion from this is the pretty simple message that if there's no water, there is no ecosystem. And we find the really extreme examples of this in the driest parts of the planet, such as Chile's Atacama Desert, which is where the image on this slide comes from. And the central Atacama, the driest part of the world outside of the poles, doesn't really have an ecosystem. There's a few bacterial species found there only. It's so devoid of biology that we use it as an analog for Mars. But, and there's a big but, most deserts are not like the Atacama. And most of the time, even in fairly dry places, we do in fact see ecosystems. And the reason for this is that plants have a very broad range of pretty nifty tricks to make use of the water that they can get to. Now those tricks might be that they only grow when water is available. That's the trick that say the annual wildflowers and that bottom left hand image are using. These guys hang out as seeds until the rains fall. They go through their life cycle very quickly to produce more seeds while water's still available. They shed those seeds and then they wait for the next lot of rain. Or the plants might be able to store water within themselves and have a really nifty form of photosynthesis that does a lot of internal recycling of carbon so that they don't have to open their stomata to let too much new carbon dioxide in. Those are the tricks that cacti use. Or they might have very deep root systems so that the plants make sure they get every last drop of rain that did fall on that land surface. And we see that very commonly in dry areas. Or they might just be tough. They might have water carrying vessels and leaves that are very good at resisting the downsides of getting dry. And that's something we see very commonly in Australian plants like the Banksia on the right. So all of this raises a pretty imperative question, which is whether these tricks will continue to work well as climate changes. And to illustrate this, I thought I'd take you to another ecosystem in Southwest Western Australia, namely the Jarra forests. So Jarra are endemic to the region that's shaded in red on the map. And when they are able to grow into a mature forest, which does take them several hundred years, they form a tall open canopy of really magnificent trees. Jarra does also have a trick to get its roots on water and its trick is all about the shape of its root system. 
which is called a dimorphic root system, meaning it's got two shapes to it. The first is where the roots spread out horizontally very close to the land surface. And these roots are trying to catch this winter's rain and also to grab whatever nutrients they can at the forest floor. But the rest of the roots sink down as a series of deep tap roots and spread out again when they find water at a water table or in deep soil reserves. Now, historically, there was plenty of that deep water in these forests, and we would see it coming to the surface in the form of streams, creeks, lakes, wetlands, and so on. And so the jarrah flourished. The problem that we face is that the range of the jarrah is really in the hot seat for climate change in southwest Western Australia. And winter rainfall in this area over the recent decades has been the lowest on record. It's been profoundly different to the past. And what this has resulted in is that those groundwater levels have been dropping. And that's really all I want you to take from this graph, um, that from the early 1990s to the present, we are seeing big drops in groundwater throughout the Jarrah Forest. And presumably as a consequence of this, since about 2013 onwards, we've also started to see jarrah trees dying during periods of particularly hot, dry weather. So here's a jarrah forest subsequent to one of those periods of death. And although we can still see the tree trunks there, it's not really clear that what remains is forest any longer. It might be an ecosystem in transition. Jarrah has been experiencing drought mortality but it's only one of many forests around the world. Now, this map is only mapping where researchers have produced studies about drought mortality. And so to some extent, it's a map of where people are doing research on this topic as much as it is a map of where this problem is occurring. But regardless, it's very clear that drought mortality is increasing and it's a global phenomenon. And it's a problem. It's a problem because it is not clear that forests that experience severe drought mortality are necessarily going to recover. And from some very pragmatic points of view, it's a problem when we think about managing disturbance and hazard. For example, if we think about wildfire, one of the biggest risks that firefighters face in bush or wildland firefighting operations is the risk of a dead tree falling on them. So for example, in California, which has experienced profound drought mortality, there are really large areas where wildland firefighters cannot control fires because it is too risky for them to enter the forest because of the risk of tree fall from previous year's droughts. So in Australia, we are also quite familiar with the challenges around fighting bushfires. Avoiding these sorts of drought mortality events becomes quite imperative from that point of view. It's also imperative for water because when ecosystems undergo great change, so too does water. And this can be very dramatic and evident. For example, post fire flooding and erosion, which is what's shown in that image on the right, or the rising of saline water tables following the clearing of deep rooted trees, a big problem also in Western Australia and shown in the central image. It can also be subtle, such as the way that the catchments of the Murray-Darling Basin do not appear to have recovered to their pre-drought hydrology, as in they don't shed as much stream flow, following the millennium drought. And this seems to be to do with the way that water has been used by vegetation in those catchments. It can be very large scale, for example, changes in rainfall patterns over the Amazon in response to large spread land clearing, or it can be frankly paradoxical, such as the situation south of the Sahara in the area known as the Sahel, where increasing droughts have also caused increasing floods and the connections all to do with plants. In fact, water is essential to ecosystems, but equally ecosystems are essential to water. They're essential to the fate of rain and to the quality of water resources. So much so that our water systems connect the interior of the continent to the coast and all the way out into our ocean ecosystems. So that what we are doing on the land affects the health of places like the Great Barrier Reef, 
because of the connection through the water cycle. This relationship between land-based ecosystems and water is increasingly recognised through the concept of watershed ecosystem services, which attempts to delineate and explain how it is that watersheds and the ecosystems within them result in the provisioning of water, the properties of the water that is provisioned, and all of the associated benefits to people and to ecology that come. We are also increasingly seeing engineers looking to ecosystems for inspiration about the management of water in more human dominated environments, whether that be for urban stormwater management, industrial wastewater treatment, or the regulation of water in agricultural industries, increasingly ecosystems are used as an inspiration for design. And so what I hope I've left you with, with this very high level overview, is that from the smallest scale of those pores opening and shutting beneath a leaf, through to the scale of the watersheds that connect the land to the coast, water and ecosystems are intrinsically tied together. They are changing together, and those changes can be complex, difficult to reverse, and have profound implications. Consequently, being able to keep our eye on those connections and to make good decisions about how we manage a changing environment is really critically important. And it's the reason I'm so glad that TURN has started to turn its focus to this connection between water and life. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think we have had absolutely splendid speakers. So I can see the connection. We've got all the data or the recognition of where our groundwater dependent ecosystems are sitting in the atlas with Eloise taking good care of it. Tim can help us work out where all the uh, water might be getting used across the country. And um, Sally, you've got some really important messages there about uh, no water, no ecosystems, and obviously no biodiversity as, as a result. Now we have had quite a few questions, so I hope everyone's going to uh, stay with us and listen to the, um, the questions. And uh, so first of all, Jason, you would like Tim to tell you whether we have seen any continental or regional trends in the water balance. Um, I know you haven't had your product out there very long, but have you managed to have a look at that? Oh, there's, well, not, not using our particular product to date, but we have, yeah, with other products, like with where there was a version of it that was uh, with Modus at 500 metres, and definitely the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But I guess what we want to do with the new high resolution product is um, start to look at the changes in water use with GDEs and um, the catchments that have had fires several times. Um, to look at those high resolution um, water use changes. That's really good. And, and while you're talking, can you tell us um, about whether we've validated anything intensively with irrigation areas such as within the Murray Darling Basin? Yeah, so I guess we, we've used the TURN OSFLUX network and that's got a really strong emphasis on the natural ecosystems in Australia. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any flux towers located in irrigated agriculture. And as a large water user in regional Australia, reportedly about 70% of Australia's regional water use is, is through irrigated agriculture. I think it would be a great thing for TURN and or other organisations to increase the numbers of flux towers in those sort of environments and probably also riparian vegetation as well. I know Tanya Duty from CSIRO Land and Water in Adelaide, she's been doing some good work with that with CHUO and MDBA. Um, the irrigated agriculture is, I think, a bit of a, um, bit of a blind spot for us as a, as a continent. So Tim's mentioned the importance of flux towers. Sally, what piece of infrastructure do you think you need most? Because I know that you are leading the critical zone observatories of Australia, which would have a fair emphasis on um, groundwater and water and ecosystems. What do you need most? And yeah. 
Um, I look, I think the infrastructure that, I, I think the product that Tim's pulling out in combination with the sorts of products that Eloise is working with are fabulous. And I am anticipating PhD students at this end working on exactly the problem of fire in groundwater dependent ecosystems using Tim's data sources. So I think they really all do come together. Some of the challenges, of course, that we face are around validation of remotely sensed products. And Tim's done a great job on that. That's something that needs to happen across multiple scales. Flux towels are fabulous. We do run into places that we can't observe very well with that technology. Um, for instance, in places where the terrain is very mountainous and it's very difficult to draw good interpretations from flux towers. So I would really love to see the idea of nested across scale observatories that take us from what flux footprints can do that complement towers with things like sap flux. So that's measurement of the water fluxes within trees themselves. Uh, ideally locating those inside watersheds, which we can also close the water balance over so that we have some way to cross check things right across scales. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're close to having a lot of that infrastructure, but we often, for example, don't see flux towers co-located with stream gauging networks. And, and I think that's an opportunity that we could look to. Thank you very much for that, Sally. We are, uh, oh no, there was a question for Tim and Eloise. How can we parse how dependent terrestrial vegetation is on groundwater versus green precipitation for their growth? Both are important. Would be great to get a sense of how much plant transpiration is in each source. We may um, get you to answer that one in just a minute. I'm just going to do a wrap up, but, but those who are interested in the answer, please stay. Um, but I'm very aware that we're up to our time. So what I want to do is thank everyone for taking part in this final webinar for the year and let you know that we have got lots more planned for next year. Uh, first Wednesday of every month at the same time that you've had today. And with that, I'd just like to um, say thank you, everyone. And um, we'll now cut back to the answering that question and let those who need to go go so we'll see you see you everyone next year good festive season everyone yeah. Tim and Sally did you want to answer that question uh, do you want me to have a go or Tim do you want to go first uh, if you have a go that'd be lovely thank you Okay, sure. Well, I hope I'm interpreting it correctly um, about the greenness of vegetation, whether it's due to, to groundwater or to precipitation. Is that the, the way you interpret it, Tim? Um, I'm trying to find it. Sorry. You, you, just, you just have a... Um, who's the question from? Which person? Sorry. Was, was it? McKerney. C, C. McKerney. Yeah. Yep, so yep, my, okay. yeah, my, my take on it is that we already do have some um, satellite based products that try to distinguish between uh, greenness due to, um, to precipitation as opposed to greenness due to, to water from other sources. So there's the inflow dependence grid that's part of the, the GDE atlas and um, it, try, it highlights where um, where you have ecosystems that are dependent on, on water sources other than, than rainfall. Um, so that's that's the idea. That, that would be my, my first take on an answer. Tim, mm. over to you. Um, well, yeah, we can, with, with thermal remote sensing, we can estimate um, transpiration from soil evaporation. But I think with the deeper roots, as Sally mentioned, is that the main opportunity is through isotope traces. Um, I don't really know a lot about that, but there's there's lots of people who know a lot more about isotopes than me. But I think I think that's the, the nub of the question. Um, yeah. Fantastic. I'm just checking to see if there, uh, there was one. Oh yeah, Sally's answered. Um, I'm very happy to speak to the isotopic traces and what those are and how they work, if that's of interest, but equally, if there's other questions to get on to, no dramas. Jessica has said 
Thanks. So we're probably good on that one. So maybe I shall just go back to sharing my screen and we'll say goodbye to everyone and thank them once again for um, being here.